All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, we're so happy to have you. We know you have a lot of um, things you could do with your time, and we're happy that you've chosen to spend your time with us. I'm Stephanie Lynch. I'm OHD's Senior Technology and Research Manager. Uh, I'm joined today by our Marketing Manager, Justin Lobdell. Hello, everyone. Yes, say hello, Justin. Mm -hmm. Justin's going to be monitoring the chat, so feel free to uh, drop in any comments or questions, and he'll, you know, he'll interject as he sees fit. And we are joined today by a very special guest uh, and a good friend of OHD. This is Aaron Apostolico, and he's the business unit manager for health and safety products for <coughs> Sentinel. And Aaron, why don't you give a little, give us a little bit of your background? Thank you, Stephanie, and it's a pleasure being here with OHD today. Thank you for hosting. Uh, so I'm the business unit uh, manager uh, based out of. Uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, where we actually manufacture the health and safety instrumentation. Um, <clears throat> we work with LSI on our heat stress <clears throat> monitoring equipment, excuse me. Uh, I've been in industrial hygiene for a little over 21 years. Uh, I'm a certified industrial hygienist and a certified safety professional. And uh, <clears throat> I have many years of experience performing heat stress monitoring as well as other industrial hygiene monitoring in the field. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about uh, our line of heat stress monitoring equipment. Very nice. We're super excited about it. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to give just a little bit of background uh, before we let Aaron jump into his kind of meat and potatoes. Um, so these are just some, some sort of foundational information, right? So I think we're all hearing a lot more about heat stress. And so heat stress is the overall burden and load in the form of physiological stress that exposure to excessive amount of heat is putting on our bodies. So several factors play into this load uh, and heat illnesses result from heat stress. So those heat illnesses have a wide range of symptoms and severity, and they also don't have to progress. You don't, you don't necessarily start with sort of a lower level of um, heat illness and then <coughs> progress to a higher one. You can go straight to heat stroke. And people also have uh, very different levels of sensitivity to that heat stress. So we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. So this is just to show those heat illnesses, you know, visually based on their severity. As I mentioned, this is not really a progression. So you're not, you don't have heat rash before developing heat cramps and so forth and so on. So heat rash also um, down here in the South, what we call prickly heat. I don't know if you've, if you've ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> ever had it, but it often occurs in hot human environments. And that's where that sweat is not going to be able to evaporate off of your skin. And so it's going to clog up your sweat ducts and you're going to get a nasty rash on them. Have, any, have either of y'all had heat I rash? have, yes. And then, you know, it, it can come on quite quickly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then it takes so, so long to go away. <laughs> and then every time you get it, it seems like it's just easier to get next time, next time you have that exposure. So, you know, it, lots of us probably have had heat, heat rash, but there's also heat cramps. And I would bet most of us have had heat cramps. And mine in particular, for some reason, don't hit me when I'm actually performing the activity usually. Usually it's when I go to lay in bed at night, that night, when I'm finally getting to relax and mm -hmm. <laughs> my leg just, you know, takes on a life of its own. So that's usually also combined with um, dehydration. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So those are those painful muscle spasms you get. And they're essentially caused by sweating while you're performing just um, strenuous physical activity. I think a lot of us would associate them with sports, but they absolutely happen on your job when you have a when you're performing strenuous labor, mm -hmm. right? Uh, those can also occur alone, or they can occur with some of these other heat illnesses. So just, just be aware of that. Um, okay. Then the next sort of one we want to discuss is heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion is going to be a more severe stage of heat illness, and it's going to happen when you sweat excessively, and it's causing you to lose too much fluid and too much salt, um, too much of those electrolytes. You will still sweat, but... Uh, one of the kind of telltale signs is that pale, clammy skin. Uh, you might get a headache. You might get dizzy. Your stomach can be upset. Uh, you actually can't experience fainting. You can fall out. That's something that can happen from, from heat exhaustion. And then our big, bad heat illness, of course, is heat stroke. And heat stroke, uh, it's going to take you out. That's when you're going to get that hot, dry skin. You've stopped sweating. And once your body stops sweating, your heat can just go up 
real fast. That in internal core temperature is going to rise very quickly. Um, another interesting thing about heat stroke is sometimes it doesn't kill you immediately. Uh, what it does is it causes damage that's going to shut down some of your major body organs and you're not going to be able to recover. So it's actually kind of after the fact you're having these lingering things. Another thing is that with each, each of these, we talked about just the rash being where, you know, it comes <clears throat> on and it's going to come on more easily. If you experience any heat related illness, you're going to be more susceptible to future heat related mm -hmm. illnesses. So just keep that in mind. So these are some of the risk factors that are going to uh, contribute to that heat stress on your body. So I'm not really sure how well you can see this graphic. Um, these are the environmental individ and individual risk factors for heat stress. And this can be found at NIOSH. I got this right off of NIOSH's website. So some risk factors, of course, are your environmental conditions, right? How hot is the air around you? Uh, how much is that air moving? Um, you know, radiant heat exposure. So typically when we're talking about that, we're talking about the sun, but since we're talking about industry today, there's lots of radiant heat sources out in industry, right? Mm -hmm. So others are related to your work. Uh, how strenuous is your work? What gear do you have to wear to perform that work? All of that's going to impact that. And then still others are personal. So that's going to be your age, your fitness level, uh, medications that you may be taking, alcohol use, caffeine consumption, um, just your general level of hydration. You know, these are all personal factors that impact our susceptibility to, to heat illness and, and our uh, reaction essentially to heat stress. And you can see how, especially if you're out there working in safety, you can see how accounting for some of these individual risk factors could be quite tricky, right? You would need to have a really good relationship with your employees to get the feedback you would need to know about some of these things. So let's also mention, you know, with the personal factors, um, it's magnified if you're not acclimatized. And I'll talk a little bit more about acclimatized versus not acclimatized. But if you're not used to that heat, it takes your body a while to adapt to those conditions. And that can add to those personal stress factors. Such a very good point. You know, um, I, I don't know the statistics, so I don't want to state it, but I know a large majority of the heat illnesses that happen out in the workplace are to those people who just started that job and were not properly acclimated to that work or to that heat. So we know that's a big problem. Absolutely. And, and I'll just add to that, that um, most people think that heat illness is um, you know, relegated to just the South where I live down in Florida, where it's, you know, sunny and hot all the time. But the truth is uh, a lot of those um, OSHA recordables actually happen in more Northern environments because of that acclimation. Uh, when you're moving from those cold, you know, outside conditions, maybe to a hot indoor work environment and you're not acclimatized to it, you can actually have a higher um, incident rate. Yeah, that's absolutely well, true. Good, such a good point. Okay, so of course we all care, right? We care about this because we care about our employees. We want them to go home uh, in at least the same condition, if not better than what they came to their job, right? So that's why we care. But I found some of these just, just very startling and they're worth mentioning. So every day, 11 workers are seriously injured or die from heat stress. Uh, the three-year average of work-related deaths caused by heat has doubled since the 90s. Um, and I think I should mention that this is likely underreported. There's a lot of research out there that suggests that ultimate injuries that may have had a cause that was related to heat exposure. So you develop that confusion or dizziness and maybe you have an accident or you have that heat exposure and it fogs your glasses or it makes your hands sweat. And now you've become more susceptible to having that accident. So there's this, this theory out there that a lot of this, we have accidents that are related to heat, but heat isn't identified as the no kind of root cause. cause. Mm -hmm. So heat mm -hmm. is also the leading weather related killer. Um, which shocked me. So that's more than tornadoes, hurricanes, all the stuff combined. Wow. Um, so it's over 500 a year, according to the CDC. And no matter the cause, I'm not trying to get political here, it is getting hotter. Like objectively, the world's getting hotter. So we're going to have more heat and it's something that we just need to care about. Absolutely. Okay. So if that wasn't good enough reason for any of y'all <laughs> to care, <laughs> then guess what? <laughs> You're regulated to do so. 
And I wanted to make a point of this because you, you've actually always been regulated to do so. You are required by OSHA to provide your employees with a workplace that is free from any recognized hazards that are likely to cause injury or death. And so this is how heat, in heat injury and illness can be cited. And this is how it could always be cited. So there's also a national emphasis program, which you may have heard of, <laughs> that was very recently released, which we'll kind of touch oh, on. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Before we move on to that, uh, you know, the national emphasis program, uh, which you're going to talk about here, but there's also <laughs> state programs and states have actually had for many years um, some heat stress. And, and that includes, I know, California, I think Washington State has had some. So there's been several state OSHA programs that have actually had regulations and standards on the books for many years now. And it's just coming around uh, because of at a national level, they have seen it as such a critical root cause, as you mentioned, to so many different injuries, whether it was a direct heat illness, or like you said, it was um, heat that may have caused uh, another injury, whether it was, you know, a slip trip fall injury or another type of injury that the primary injury uh, was more of the focus as opposed to, you know, the heat stress, which may have led to. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I actually just saw this morning where California's OSHA, their second most highly cited um, issue was heat stress. So mm -hmm. very good point. Um, but so we probably all have heard about this national emphasis program. So just placing even more emphasis on what we know is a very serious issue. But just since April of this year, uh, OSHA has placed this national emphasis on heat related illness. Um, it does apply to all industries, but they do target those that are considered at risk. And there's quite an extensive list of those. If you're not sure whether your industry is on there, you really should go check that site because they are planning to uh, double their amount of heat-related inspections, and then any OSHA inspection is going to include them asking you about your heat-related prevention program. Uh, another kind of important thing is the threshold where they're then identifying these heat priority days. So if it's above 80 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity is above 40%, OSHA is going to call that a heat priority day, and that's going to ramp up their efforts, mm -hmm. at least for these regional offices. So just some, some, some kind of Critical information there. Uh, okay, I'm now going to let Aaron take the lead. He's going to roll into uh, what may be, you know, even more value, valuable is, is how maybe, or some solutions, right? Some things Absolutely. we can do. So I definitely want to talk about some solutions here. Um, let's tie it back a little bit to, to OSHA and this national emphasis program. Um, when OSHA shows up on site, or if you have a state program, um, they generally follow what's known as the OSHA technical manual. And um, I'll, I'll cite this section. It's section three, chapter four, specifically related to heat stress and how they monitor for heat stress. Um, and that's using a WBGT instrument. And for those not familiar with what WBGT is, that's the wet bulb globe temperature. And the wet bulb globe temperature is really the most accurate way to identify um, all the heat stresses that an individual worker sees on, you know, uh, as applied to them, including um, that wet, natural wet bulb temperature, which is really um, an indicator of their ability, you know, to cool itself through evaporative heat. Okay. All right. So we'll get into that a little bit more. But as we talk about our different solutions, um, we have, you know, the different monitoring equipment. So um, there are some standards out there, some international standards that actually govern this. So, you know, while our focus here is with OSHA, um, you know, this has been uh, a standard that has been worldwide for several years now um, and really in practice, mainly in Europe, but in several other com uh, countries that have adopted uh, the ISO standard as well. So that is ISO standard uh, 7243. Uh, they came out with a 2017 version, which kind of was a, an update to the standard. And this really talked about devices for monitoring those um, physical, ergonomic, you know, thermal environments uh, with a focus on heat stress uh, because of the number of injuries related worldwide to uh, these thermal um, heat strain and stress uh, issues. So there are both portable and fixed heat stress meters that are on the market. Um, all of them have something in common. They have 
three main sensors. So those are going to be your black globe temperature. All right. So you'll hear um, me refer to that as the globe temperature today. Uh, there's the ambient temperature. Um, you may also hear me refer to it as the dry bulb temperature. And then there's the natural wet temperature. All right. And, and so these three things are just helping us better quantify the exposure of an actual person, right? Because there's all these different factors. So that's right. Okay. So, you know, a typical thermometer that you would have in your house mm -hmm. is really just a dry bulb thermometer and it's only measuring that dry bulb heat. But knowing how much, you know, humidity is in the air um, and then the ability for it to evaporate through air movement and cooling. So that's what that uh, natural wet temperature is going mm -hmm. to measure. And then the black globe temperature uh, really takes that radiant heat, mentioned radiant heat or solar load. Um, so, you know, through um, those solar rays and ultraviolet, these can also contribute to heat stress. And, you know, this is why you can get sunburned on a cloudy day. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's part of that heat load that the, um, you know, outdoor solar load can take into effect. Um, so for the WBGT method, um, we can measure it both indoor and outdoor. So that's with and without the solar load presence of the sun. Um, but there's other uh, results related to a WBGT effective heat stress. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, here you have illustrated several different systems. Uh, and this can include um, some units for surveying. Um, we have some portable outdoor units. Uh, we have some fixed outdoor systems as well as some fixed indoor systems. And I'll talk about all three of um, or these multiple solutions um, as we proceed. So the intent of these heat stress monitors is really to assess the local environment for the workers and what they can get out of that. As you mentioned, you are the heat strain conditions, the heat stress, uh, cold stress, and even hypothermia. So in addition to obviously the hotter environments, there are times where we want to measure those colder environments too, because those can also affect um, worker conditions and injury as well. So the heat stress equipment uh, can be used for both monitoring heat stress as well as cold stress. Um, I do want to call out that term local environment. Um, many end users would, you know, go and use their mobile phones. And while that's really, you know, a, a good accessible tool, the truth is that when you look up your local weather, um, it's at a central location, a lot of times airports or at a local weather station. And that can be miles away from your site. And the conditions that, you know, your phone is reporting are not necessarily the same conditions you have at your local work site, and especially if you're indoors. So having a WBGT monitor is really getting that local environmental condition that the employees are exposed to. That makes a lot of sense because I know I have the OSHA heat stress app mm -hmm. on my phone. And like you said, it's, you know, it's maybe good for a spot check and it, it, it does give you some cool, there's a precaution thing you can check on there and it'll, it'll tell you some things for, for that environment, but you're right. It's not measuring right where I am. And it, it's also not, not really measuring everything, right? It's only doing. Correct. Right. And you're not getting that natural it's only wet. Heat yeah. Yes. And, and it's not taking into account air movement. Mm -hmm. So getting, you know, a monitor that is local that can do the full <laughs> WBGT sensor array um, is critical for really seeing what your employees are exposed to at that time in that location. And is that really OSHA's expectation for how you would? It is. Okay. And, and, you know, they do cite heat index as kind of an indicator of, yes, today's going to be a priority day to go out and measure. But when they get on site, they are going to be using WBGT meters to actually um, assess the um, effective WBGT. And I'll talk about what that includes uh, because they also look at other factors like um, metabolic rate and clothing adjustment factors. So the primary requirements for a heat stress monitor are laid out in that ISO standard 7243, um, but they're also laid out in OSHA's technical manual, as I mentioned before, in section three, chapter four of the OSHA technical manual, they call out what is a WBGT meter um, and what it's comprised of. So it is those, uh, you know, three core sensors. It also has a relative humidity uh, meter in there. So you can get heat index out of it at a local location, but more so um, 
OSHA is going to be concerned what the WBGT uh, effective value is. Okay. Right. Um, these instruments, you know, are a, uh, you know, a primary instrument and, and your sensors are calibrated and they really should be accurate within a half a degree Celsius or about 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, you're holding it to a tight standard because even, you know, a degree or two can really be the difference of pushing so, uh, you know, a worker over the line, depending on their, their workload. Well, if you, if you think about a good faith effort to comply mm -hmm. with this national emphasis program, if you already know it's going to be hot where you are, like you're getting that heat sure. in then you're really, you're going to want to show that you've done something more, that you've, you've set something up to know those Absolutely. environments. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, the, the other, um, you know, benefit is you don't want to necessarily do too much because when you start putting controls in place in these work environments, um, you know, it can reduce production because you might have to go to a work rest ratio that's appropriate for the WBGT values and, and the, the exceedance of the threshold. So in order to prevent injuries, you may reduce workload, but you don't want to do that um, more than necessary. So having a WBGT meter might tell you, yes, now we're in a work condition and maybe that condition's present for you know four out of the eight hours, but if it drops below it, you may be able to resume normal working activities. Well, and one thing OSHA recommends is offsetting hours, right? So performing that work either earlier in the day or later in the evening, not later in the evening, but when it starts to cool off, you know. Um, so there, there, there are things Absolutely. you can do to maybe up that productivity. I would also contend because I do I'm working out in <laughs> different boundaries sure. and stuff. I, I hate the the idea that anything you would do for safety might reduce productivity. Because I will say your employees, if you're just wearing them out every day and they're just going home exhausted, you're not getting your best out of them, right? Sure. So if you're showing them, number one, that you do care about them, that can improve job, job satisfaction. Okay. That can improve morale. Is, morale is very, I mean, important. It, yeah. very important. And so then, you know, the, you know there's a trade-off, right? Sure. And it can go either direction, but ultimately you're always better off caring about your people for sure. Fantastic. So yeah, beyond the benefits of protect, preventing illness, you know, there's secondary benefits for actually um, improving productivity by having a proper work rest ratio in place when these conditions are present. Mm -hmm. And in order to know when those conditions are present and then not present, mm -hmm. having, you know, meters on site to actually measure that are very helpful. Let me continue. So some additional uh, features related to these instruments. Uh, you can kind of see I have um, a couple of these WBGT meters right behind me. Um, these meters have a two-inch black globe on them. Um, the ISO standard references a six-inch black globe. Um, so we offer both the six-inch and the two-inch uh, black globe. Uh, in order to convert down to a two-inch, there is a uh, calculation that follows the ISO standard uh, built into the machine. Uh, which allows it to uh, convert from the, the six inch um, solar uh, radiant heat uh, calculation down to the two inch. So that is already built into the instruments. So it's really uh, just a practical consideration. You don't want to be wandering around with one of these with that six inch globe on there. Is that I mean, it's a preference. Some people want the traditional ISO okay. uh, compliance standard, which uses the six inch, but for portability, mm -hmm. uh, you can use the two inch, but I do want to assure people that even though it is the two inch, it does comply with the ISO standard. Okay. Right. Um, we talked about measuring wind speed. So the natural wet actually has a wick, which as the air movement goes um, you know, across the wick, um, it reduces it. So you are measuring somewhat of the air movement with the natural wet temperature uh, by itself. However, there's other values to use a anemometer, which measures wind speed or a wind cup sensor. And you can add those to these units. There is a way to connect them up to the units where you can record that data as well. And that again goes back to the local conditions. So let's say you might have controls in place where you add fans or you have local ventilation that you want to be able to identify, okay, you know, we were able to reduce the heat by so much airflow and we can uh, monitor what that airflow was and those conditions of that control that was put in place. So in addition to the monitors, we do sell accessories uh, such as these hot wire anemometers or wind cup sensor that can actually plug into the instrument. And we can data log that data as well as your WBGT information. Okay. So just to get even more 
honed in to what honed your conditions what are your local local requirements. Local. Absolutely. Um, now with our um, fixed systems indoors, as well as our fixed outdoor and portable systems, um, you can download that data as well. And you can use the software which allows you to manipulate and come up with some, you know, um, calculations that are after the fact. Um, but if you wanted to, you can actually connect to uh, some servers, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, and get some real-time information, including having real-time alerts if those thresholds are exceeded. So those alerts can be through like text, um, SMS text messages or emails, but you may also connect a visual or audio alarm system. So those are some other options that we can do or utilize with the uh, fixed and outdoor and portable systems. Very cool. So actually here, sorry, this is a slide that kind of shows you some of those accessories. So in that upper left corner is a hot wire anemometer. Um, the one in the top middle, that's your wind cup sensor to measure that airspeed. Uh, of course, on the uh, upper right, you can see the, excuse me, the alarm uh, where you can have just a visual or just an audio, or if you want to have both, it can be set up with that. Um, the satellites can communicate um, to a master hub, but we also have repeaters, um, which can extend the distance that these satellites can be from a, um, a receiver. Um, it should also be noted that uh, for those outdoor systems, uh, if they're in remote areas where you might not have uh, power, you can actually power the systems through a solar panel. So we actually sell the solar panel kits, which can connect to a, uh, uh, a main hub, which is gonna have your um, alpha logger in it that is also powered by a battery, but that battery is now charged through a solar source as opposed to, to AC power. Oh, very cool. So now I want to get into really our different types of systems that we have. Um, I mentioned the heat shield, which is our primary survey tool. So th this is a great screening tool. It's typically used by uh, you know, health and safety consultants uh, inside you know, health and safety teams to really get some baseline data, um, you know, these data log. And um, you see the base unit here and the optional satellites. And um, it has, you know, eight megabytes of storage, which is actually, you know, weeks and weeks worth of storage data. I mean, that, that's a tremendous amount because it really doesn't take up a lot of uh, data on the uh, display. And that can be downloaded using our uh, HS Manager software. Mm -hmm. And then you can do some post assessments uh, through the uh, PC software, uh, which comes with it. Um, there's a few different models. Uh, as I mentioned, you can get it with the two inch bulb or the six inch bulb. Um, if you want a uh, base unit without a radio signal, uh, you can get it without the radio signal or again with the radio signal. Okay. Uh, the radio signal is needed with the satellites. Um, and the advantage of the satellites is you can actually um, get two satellites with a base unit and you can position them, you know, in multiple distances away from a heat source. So say you had a furnace and you wanted to say, okay, well, how far back, you know, is a safe condition. Mm -hmm. So I might want to monitor in, you know, three local spots. Maybe there's a walkway nearby. Um, I could do it that way. Um, as we all know, also heat rises. So sometimes you want to look at stratification. Mm -hmm. So maybe a, a specific distance away from a heat source, but you want to measure, you know, at ankle height, Kind of your torso and then like head height mm -hmm. so you can look at it as a stratified layer and uh, we do sell it with some accessories uh like uh, tripods and even mounting poles to bring it up even higher to higher conditions as well yeah i know whenever i've done the surveys i've always had to have it at a certain height it was like yeah. 1.1 1 .1 meters something where you were okay you can follow the iso yeah. standards and, and they, they pull back from the uh ankle torso mm -hmm. head um i think kind of standards but uh, it's still an option. It's still performed today. So that's something you can do with the uh, base and two satellites. I just love the idea of some sort of like heat mapping, essentially, because I, I think that would really show, you know, if you did have OSHA come in, yeah. like you would show that you really are performing that hazard assessment, which I know that's just, it's going to mean everything if you've really Absolutely. done some assessment. Very similar to, you know, for, for safety professionals and other IHs, um, the way you would do a sound level map. Mm -hmm. So you, that's know, exactly you, what know, I was thinking. you know what areas, you know, are, hot zones. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to have an exclusion zone or you, you know, 
inside this area, you know, you have to be more cautious or limit your time, you know, beyond a certain point, um, just like you would need to wear hearing protection within certain areas, mm -hmm. you know, where you have high sound. So our stationary multi-position, um, you know, th this can be used in, in bakeries and foundries, um, automotive manufacturing. Um, I know glass manufacturing is very, you know, hot furnaces where, you know, they have to melt the glass, um, aerospace defense. I mean, th there's a number of applications that can use these fixed systems. Uh, most commonly, they would uh, mount them to, you know, columns or, you know, a wall location, um, you know, in an area where workers um, are exposed to those higher heat sources. Now, these systems can be tied into a, uh, uh, a real-time dashboard. They work through that Zigbee radio uh, signal. Um, that can be up to 300 meters outdoors, but indoors, uh, it can be far less. And it's really dependent on if there's structure in the uh, um, facility. So that could be walls or other equipment or, or process equipment that can reduce it. So in order to gain that um, extended distance away from the hub that receives the data, we also uh, sell repeaters that can uh, be also put into the facility. So you don't need the full, you know, WBGT meters uh, to communicate. You can use the repeaters to get it back to the hub. Oh, you know what? I forgot to even ask. Um because this was an interesting question that I've done here a couple of times. How far can that satellite unit on the previous, the WBGT, the heat shield, how sure. far can that satellite be placed away? So with the uh, heat shield units, it's really up to 300 meters. Okay. And that's outdoor mm -hmm. with line of sight. Um, if you're, you know, outdoor and there's like other structures mm -hmm. outdoors, um, it could, you know, drastically reduced to maybe 50 meters. Okay. So it's really dependent upon, you know, if you have a clear line of sight or if there's structure in the way. Sorry to go back. No, no, not a problem. Um, within the units, again, you're, you can calculate your WBGT uh, with and without solar load. Um, and you can also, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how we get to the effective WBGT as well as uh, comparing it to reference WBGT values to know what the thresholds are and that's, am I below it or above it? That effective value, that's what OSHA is going to be? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I have another slide coming up where I'll really talk about that effective value. Uh, before I leave this one, um, again, an advantage of this is if you have it set up in your facility, um, you can actually um, set your thresholds. And then if your thresholds are exceeded, it can actually send a text message or an email to maybe a supervisor who might want to institute some of those workplace uh, controls, um, you know, as far as either rotating employees or work rest ratios, uh, maybe bring in some additional fans or cooling. So there's other things that they can do if they know those thresholds have been exceeded. So, you know, having that ability to either have a local alarm or send them an alert to their phone or email might be beneficial. And that's something that you can get customized with these systems. Absolutely. I know a lot of safety and health professionals who are over multiple sites. So sure. being able to have something like that that could alert you of a site specific issue, mm -hmm. that could be very valuable. Absolutely. Um, so here we're showing the portable indoor and outdoor system. So as opposed to the fixed system, uh, we have this portable system. And you, you can actually kind of see it. it it's, it's set up behind Stephanie here. Um, this system sets up on a tripod and it has all of your WBGT sensors on here. Um, and it also has a um, antenna that can um, be used to transmit uh, data, again, through that modem to your uh, that text message or, or email, or it can actually feed directly into a server system where you can download it and um, do the uh, data calculations afterwards. And, or if you wanted a real-time dashboard, you can actually use it and customize a real-time dashboard. So these systems are great for construction sites. So I know that uh, one of those industries that you talked about OSHA um, targeting you know, we have a lot of incidents related to these uh, construction sites. So this would be a great application uh, for this solution for those types of facilities where they're moving around and they might be at a construction site for weeks at a time. Again, having a portable system like uh, this would be perfect for that application. And it is weatherproof. So this can, you know, sit outside and 
um, you know, be exposed to those elements. Well, you know, my first thought was, of course, like uh, Auburn football practice field. Absolutely. You know, so sport uh, facilities, uh, military training sites, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they're moving from location to location. Now, uh, very similar to that, you can have a stationary outdoor system. So if you know that they're going to be in a mm -hmm. set area, um, whether it is a sports complex, you know, you might have a, a stationary one set up, you know, um, adjacent to the field mm -hmm. that, you know, is a, uh, a specific site. Uh, this would be hardwired in and even tied mm -hmm. into um, a control system or maybe to a control room where it can be viewed on a dashboard. Um, these systems, both the portable system and this outdoor system, uh, can be powered by a solar panel as well. So if there's not that, um, you know, AC power available, these systems can be powered, um, and even have that meteorological, uh, information as well. The solar panel just seems so practical because you're thinking about all these places where you're, mm -hmm. you know, worried about that solar load anyway, right? So sure. now you're getting to benefit, <laughs> at least take some power from that solar panel. Absolutely. Energy. Very Absolutely. Cool. And if you're moving it around, you don't want to have to connect it or run right. extension cords or have generators. So there are batteries inside the box that has the alpha, but to keep those batteries charged, you really want to have a power source. And that, again, could be AC power or it could be through the, uh, the solar panel. So I talked about the different communication systems. Um, I do want to note that these communication systems do not apply to the heat shield, but really to those fixed systems and the indoor outdoor portable systems and the um, fixed outdoor system. Well, like you kind of mentioned, these were used more for your survey yes. stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so in order to really, you know, identify what the instant you can check. So the base unit does have a display and you can scroll through that display, but you physically have to go up to it mm -hmm. and, you know, you can see where you are throughout the day, but you have to, you know, check on it. Right. Whereas the fixed systems don't have a display, but can alert you through, you know, a modem and, and using like a SIM card to transmit that data and then send you that email or text message to let you know that threshold has been exceeded. Well, yeah. And so I just really wish that, you know, I'd had different equipment when I worked for the army as an mm -hmm. industrial hygienist, I had my WIBGIT, my sure. WBGT, and we had to do just what you're talking about. It was set up outside and it was out front of our office. So again, I'm kind of missing that local environment factor, right? Cause I'm Absolutely. not exactly where the soldiers are and I would have to go out every 15 minutes and, you know, check it. And then it, we had levels where at some point you alert, you know, command teams of Absolutely. dangerous conditions, but it was, you know, it was not. A It'd be great. nicer just to set one yeah, of the portable, so set a portable system out there mm -hmm. and then it would still alert you and them because you could send multiple right. text messages, you know, to multiple people. So mm -hmm. maybe it sends it to command, but also to, you know, your drill instructor to let, you know, them know, hey, we're above a certain threshold. Yeah, such a, such a great improvement. And, um, you know, even on those systems too, you know, if they don't have, you know, uh, a cellular device with them, they can have that local alarm system. So, it, you know, a flashing light or enunciator to let them know, hey, you've exceeded a threshold. Very cool. So I want to talk a little bit about the firmware. So the firmware has just recently changed and we're instituting a, a, an update to our firmware. And I, I, don't, I don't want to be wrong, but didn't you participate in some of these changes? I did. Okay. So uh, over the last month or so, uh, I've been working with our LSI partners uh, to institute some of these changes, which are really going to account for this effective WBGT. So that's been a part of the ISO standard, but... Um, it wasn't necessarily built into the instrument. And now what we've decided because of the ACGIH, which is the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, um, which is the uh, um, really the reference that OSHA uh, has been utilizing. And again, they, they reference in their OSHA technical manual, the ACGIH standards and tables that are utilized for um, your effective WBGT. So those TLBs. Yes, yes. So those are the TLBs and action levels. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk a little bit about both of those. So, you know, previously, um, the instruments really just measured, you know, your um, three temperature sensors, your, you know, dry bulb, uh, natural wet bulb, and your globe temperatures, relative humidity. And then if you had an anemometer or, or wind cup sensor, your, your airflow. Uh, but now you can manually input what you want to measure either with or without the solar load. So those are different calculations, and I'll show you what that is momentarily. 
You can also select whether your <clears throat> workers are acclimatized or not acclimatized. Um, you can also select from a drop-down list what the metabolic rate was. So the metabolic rate, which is measured in watts, is really associated with um, the workload of the activities that are being performed by the workforce. All right. And then lastly, I mentioned it earlier, but it, it's critically important it is the clothing adjustment value, all right, the calf. And that really says that when you're, you know, exerting, you know, force, you're expelling the, uh, expending this energy, um, it is magnified if your body cannot, you know, dissipate that heat. Mm -hmm. So when you have, you know, non-breathable clothing or double layers, uh, you want to account for that. And it actually increases that effective WBGT, which then you utilize to compare to your reference, which is that TLV or action level. And would OSHA have the expectation that you were considering those? They do. And that should be a part of your program. So when you talk about that, you know, uh, heat injury prevention program, mm -hmm. you want to take into effect, uh, effect, sorry, uh, what your, you know, uh, clothing is, what, what PPE they're wearing, uh, or it could be even just their standard uniform, uh, you know, common, you know, flame retardant, you know, clothing, again, doesn't breathe as much and can be heavier. So you actually add temperature to your WBGT index to get that effective WBGT, which then puts you more in line with what their person is um, experiencing. Right. Because it is increasing that burden. That it is. Okay. Absolutely. So here, here we show what, you know, the calculations are for the WBGT index. And the WBGT index has um, two calculations based on whether it's indoor or outdoor. So outside, you take into account that solar load, uh, which has that natural wet bulb temperature, dry bulb temperature, and globe temperature. Whereas with the uh, inside, you're really looking at your natural wet bulb temperature and your globe temperature um, only. So I talked about the WBGT effective. Um, there's a drop down menu in the instrument. So in the heat shield, you'll be able to manually select what your clothing factor is. So you'll see a list, you know, which is kind of like a drop down list. You'll scroll through it and you can select, you know, am I in long sleeves and woven pants or am I in other, um, you know, double layer clothing, or, you know, maybe I'm in an operation where I'm doing abatement and I'm wearing, you know, a Tyvek suit. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and these types of suits, you know, are additional barriers that block that. So, you know, if you're wearing a vapor barrier coveralls because they don't breathe, I mean, I've, I've worn them and I can tell you, I mean, they fill with sweat mm -hmm. and you can overheat real easy in those. And that's why you have a clothing adjustment factor of 10 degrees Celsius. So, I mean, that's huge. Um, in addition to those, I do want to note, and it's, it's bold on the screen for a reason. You take into account all of those which are not bold, but if you're also wearing a hood and this covers your head and neck, um, which, you know, as you know, is a main way to dissipate heat through your head. Right. They say, you know, if your feet are cold, put on a hat. That's right. <laughs> um, so if, if you add a hood to any of those above clothing factors, you're going to add another degree Celsius on top of adding those other factors. Can you click back on, I think you need to just click on my screen real quick. Yeah, that works. So now we... You may understand how we get our WBGT effective value, but we still need to compare it to it. So what is the reference? And the reference point is not a straight line reference point. It's actually a curve based on um, the metabolic rate. So I, I mentioned the metabolic rate. It's broken up into five categories. So that is your rest. So if you're sitting, you know, this is really at rest, kind of like we're doing right now, very mm -hmm. low, low um, you know, Heartbeat is just relaxed. Um, light is you're walking around, but you're not doing real heavy lifting. Moderate gives you, you know, a little bit more, you know, active. Um, you know, you're using tools. You might be carrying some things. So, you know, you're getting your heart rate up a little bit. You know, heavy is when you're, you know, you're really out there. You're wearing, you know, those, um, you know, layers your heart beats higher, your core temperature starts to raise a little bit more. 
Uh, and then there's very heavy. And this is when you're, you know, really exerting yourself and, you know, you're laying brick and you're, you're, you're moving, you know, you're climbing, um, you know, ladders, uh, you're moving heavy things, uh, you're working in silos, you can really get into that heavy workload. And um, you're able to select that. And depending on which metabolic rate you're in, um, it'll line up with what your threshold value is. So what we've done is we've instituted this DTTL, which is the distance to the limit. It's your delta. So you're able to see where, you know, are you over the limit or how far you are to the limit? So this gives you an idea. Uh, so on that given day, you might be, you know, one degree, you know, just below the action lim limit, uh, which is also used for those uh, not acclimatized workers. Mm -hmm. um, or it might say that, you know, today I'm, you know, one degree above it. So you'll know what that uh, distance to the limit is, whether you're exceeding it or not. And then so you know how, to, how concerned to be. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you're, you know, it's also calculating your heat index and your humidex, which is really used in Canada. Um, and then if you have those uh, wind cup sensors or the anemometer, you can also uh, do some calculations for thermal comfort. Okay. So here is that graph showing that WBGT effective value. Um, so you calculate your WBGT index and you would choose, you know, with or without solar load. So, you know, in this example, we're saying your WBGT um, without solar load um, is calculated at 23 degrees Celsius. However, we're looking at um, an employee that's wearing polyolefin coveralls. So we're going to add one degree Celsius to get our effective WBGT of 24 degrees. You then take that value and you look at what your um, reference thresholds are. So in this particular case, uh, we are saying that the workers are uh, subject to a metabolic rate of 400. All right. So on this scale, um, do you follow that up? And you can see at 400, the action level is set at 23 degrees. And your uh, reference for your threshold limit value is at 27. So before we had said that our uh, effective WBGT was 24 degrees Celsius. So if that worker was not acclimatized, they would actually be one degree above and exceed that action level. Now, if they were acclimatized and we were looking at the distance to the uh, TLB, uh, they'd be three degrees below that value. So this is good information for your site safety manager, your industrial hygienist to know. Um, it's like a new guy comes in. He's, right. he's not, he's, he shouldn't be there, right? He's not going to, yep. he's not going to make it for the whole day. And then your other guys, though, if they are acclimatized, then they're, you know, that they're okay. Yep. So okay. you, you, you might uh, go to the TLB and say, okay, so at 24, we're, we're getting close. We're going to watch it, but they're not above that threshold yet. But that not acclimatized worker, we might have to do a work rest ratio to really prevent that injury. So it's giving you both those values on the instrument and you can actually see it in real time um, by going and checking the instrument. Very nice. So some additional measurements, uh, again, using the satellites, you can, you know, collect uh, those additional positions uh, around the workers. Um, you can look at average values for individuals. Um, you can look at things like time history, variations, and then the heat index, which is uh, typically used in, in the US and um, in Canada, uh, they use something called the humidex value, which is very similar, but at a different scale. So the HS manager software, is what you would use when you uh, download the uh, heat shield instruments. And it may be hard to see, but you get basically your uh, timestamps going down the left side column. And then you have all these columns. They'll show the individual temperatures of each one of the three sensors, plus your relative humidity sensor. And then it'll do a calculation of what your WBGT is indoors your WBGT outdoors, as well as what that heat index is. Yeah. Um, 
for those that can read Italian. <laughs> uh, but real, really, uh, you know, this is showing you what those values are. Um, and then it calls out the unit of measurement. So you can switch it from degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but it can give you a chart so you can actually download a chart so you can see how uh, it performs throughout the day. You know, as you know, if you're working outside or maybe there's certain tasks or activities where you're opening a furnace and, you know, it's open, you know, for 30, 40 minutes at a time, five times during the day, when you download your time history chart, you can see where the WBGT really <coughs> spiked up during those conditions and how long those conditions were present for. So that's an advantage of, you know, downloading the data and looking at the time history chart. So you can see over that entire work shift, the different levels of exposure. Um, and, and I want to be mindful of time because I know we're, we're getting close to it. I'm yeah. almost done here. Um, Will you actually hand me that keyboard real quick? Absolutely. And then just let me know when you want me to push. Sure. So you do something real quick. Yep. Thank you. No, not a problem. So, I mean, th th this is close to the end here. And this just kind of summarizes what our um, measurements really do. And that includes that. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, the references to the ISO standard. So, you know, you're able to get the individual measurements. You're able to get your WBGT index. And then by manually selecting your clothing adjustment factor, you can now get that WBGT effective. Um, I do want to tie this back to the OSHA NEP. They do reference in that OSHA technical manual that they are looking for that uh, WBGT effective, taking into the clothing adjustment factor. And our instruments allow you now to enter in that factor so you can account for what that uh, burden is on those employees. Um, it also allows you to select that metabolic rate so that you then have the accurate reference points so you know that you're going to be above or below what those thresholds or action limit are. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, we talked about the TLV and action level uh, with the ACGIH for the acclimatized and not acclimatized workers. So if you know you have an acclimatized worker or not acclimatized worker, you can use those uh, WBGT effective values to determine, you know, the appropriate response um, conditions based on what their uh, uh, reference uh, WBGT is. Very cool. Next that slide. concludes my part. Very cool. Perfect. All right. Do we have any questions? Yeah, and that, that was a great time for any questions anyone may have. It looks um, like there's a couple in the box. Yeah. We just Uh, so, okay, I see one there that says, does the wick need to be kept wet? Yes, the wick does need to be kept wet for it to continuously measure that um, wet temperature, wet bulb bloat temperature. Yeah. Um, I will natural add, wet? Yeah, it's your natural wet bulb temperature. Um, depending on the um, environmental conditions, uh, the reservoir, which is relatively small on the heat shields because they're more of a survey tool. Mm -hmm. uh, they can last, you know, an entire day, but depending on the conditions, you may go through it. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is if the wet, natural wet temperature is the same as your dry bulb temperature, that means your reservoir is empty. <laughs> so it's a good indicator yeah, that you right. can actually <laughs> figure out, um, hey, when they start converging to that same temperature, you're going to need to replace water. Now, on the outdoor and portable systems and even the fixed systems indoor, because you don't want to have to tend to them uh, as much, they have much larger reservoirs. So, you know, th these are relatively small, but on the unit that's actually right behind you, you can see the uh, water reservoir, uh, which is that front reservoir, mm -hmm. um, is much, much larger. Yeah. Um, I'll also note that, you know, you should uh, utilize um, like a deionized water and, and not necessarily use tap water because you don't want the salts that are in it. Right. So uh, utilizing, you know, um, purified mm -hmm. and, and deionized water. Distilled water. water. Yeah. Distilled water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, second say, question. Oh, go ahead. No, say we did have a great question regarding clothing and, and metabolic heat. If y'all wanted to touch on on sure. that one as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, I would. Well, I guess you read the question first. So asking about clothing and metabolic heat, personal diet, hydration, etc. Is it better to adjust the system based on the worst case? So non-acclimatized wearing bulky PPE if you're working on a construction field. Um, 
in my opinion, that's going to be very like situation specific. But if you do know that that's a situation that could present itself, then I would absolutely be more conservative as opposed to lightening up, I guess. Uh, but if you're not going to have someone who's coming in totally unacclimatized and wearing a bunch of bulky clothing, <coughs> I don't think you should do that. Uh, that would mean you don't have to be quite as conservative, right? If you make sure that that's not a situation that sure. would present them. The great thing is you get the best of both worlds. If you want to put in the more conservative assumptions, you can still take the uh, data. When you download it into the software, you can actually run different scenarios. So if you wanted to change your clothing adjustment factor, once you download the data, mm -hmm. you can do that and see what it would be in the different clothing adjustment factor or at a different metabolic rate. Yeah. So you can actually, once you download the data, you can actually run different scenario calculations with the software. So that's an advantage that you have. So maybe you do assume, you know, maybe the worst uh, condition on the site, but if you want to, you can actually take that data and use the um, software to do some um, post-analysis calculations. Very good. Uh, I see another one here from Emily. It says, what what bulb, well, what widget reference should we use while the workers are in process of being acclimatized? Should the non-acclimatized reference be used for most of the day and the acclimatized limit used for a couple hours in the day? Um, my understanding is that the, the remaining below the non-acclimatized limit will not permit, I, I'm assuming that's going to be acclimation. Yeah. Is that correct? Um, do, do you want to take that one? Or? I'd be happy to. Um, you know, until they are acclimatized, and, and it really depends on um, the, the workforce and the conditions on the site, um, they can take days and, and sometimes weeks mm -hmm. to become acclimatized. It really depends on what their starting conditions are uh, and how hot the work environment is. So you really don't want to, you know, change it in the middle of the day. Um, ideally, in this condition, until they are acclimatized, you would use that action level for the non-acclimatized workers. So an OSHA recommends a 20% increase per day, giving you a week to uh, acclimate. But I would have to assume that they're basing that on someone who we mentioned earlier, you know, if you're in the South, then they're already here. Yep. And but like that wouldn't be the same. Like I wouldn't treat someone who just moved from Ohio yep. and goes to go to my job at the steel mill and has never worked in the steel industry and is in the yep. South now. I mean, that's a lot of things to consider. And then I, also I would be more um, concerned with someone who I, I either didn't know their health history or yep. if I did know certain health risk factors that they did have. Absolutely. And like you said, it could take up to, I mean, it, I've seen it take weeks. So the preference would be to leave it in the non-acclimatized until you really feel comfortable that they've reached that value. I agree. Okay. Bert, I think that's all, all the time we have um, okay, for now. Um, we will be, questions? yeah, we had a couple of questions about is, are the PowerPoints available? We'll, we will be sending out the PowerPoints as well as this uh, live recording um, by the end of the day to everyone that was registered. So feel free to, to pass that along. Obviously reach out to us if there's any other information you're wanting on um, heat stress monitoring or specific to uh, LSI heat stress monitoring equipment. Um, thank you to Stephanie, thank you to Aaron um, and Sensodyne for, for co-hosting with us. Um, anything else that you wanna? Oh, okay. uh, Aaron and I will field those questions. Any questions we didn't address uh, online, we'll, we'll field them. Yeah, there. absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you all so much uh, and have a great day. Yes, thank you. Thank you, guys.